Well, hey friends, welcome to my daily teaching video. In today's video, we continue my 12 part series all about freedom, the freedom that we have in Christ Jesus, the freedom that we are called to and how to work and walk out that freedom. Today, I'll be speaking about freedom from sin and freedom from shame, really important uh, truth. How to live both a called out world uh, view, but also a called in life, good. Let me do a few practicals before we jump into the teaching today. Uh, this is actually a 12 part teaching. If you're interested in downloading the entire teaching together with my PDF notes for this, those are available on my ministry school website. There'll be a link below for a donation of any kind whatsoever. Um, if you, again, a few practicals. If you're new to my YouTube channel, please consider hitting the subscribe button down there and check out the links below. My travel ministry, the churches I lead in New England, my online ministry school, uh, daily podcast, and so much more. So good to have you here. Hey, if you have a Bible in a moment, we're going to go to Colossians and the first chapter, Colossians chapter one. And uh, we began yesterday really introducing this topic of freedom. God wants you free. Jesus came to set you free. And uh, we read in uh, John chapter eight yesterday where Jesus talks to the Jews about freedom. <clears throat> and of course, their reaction is, well, we were the children of Abraham. Dude, we've never been enslaved to anybody. It's funny, at that actual time, they were literally in enslavement as a nation in a way, subjugated to the Roman Empire. And yet they identified themselves as children of Abraham. And Jesus's response and retort to them is, he who sins is a slave of sin. And Jesus had come to set them free from something from a disease, from a captivity far greater than that of the Roman Empire, Jesus comes to set us free from the bondage of sin. Come on, I really want the Holy Spirit to drop that truth in your heart today. And I, I think it's so important that we don't do what religion has done and we push this off to some future event. So often the church is taught, in effect by osmosis, that when you, you'll get free from sin when you die or you'll be free from sin when Jesus returns and turns everything new. One day, God is gonna make everything new. At the end of Revelation, it says, behold, I make all things new. But you and I are actually the first fruits of the new creation. God has a new heaven, a new earth, a new creation. He's gonna make a new Jerusalem. But right now we are, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. And in effect, we are tomorrow people. I am a Brit, I'm an American, I seem to be a French citizen actually, but I'm really a, a citizen of heaven living on the earth. And we are from Jerusalem above, not Jerusalem below. We are citizens of freedom. I said yesterday that you can recognize the citizens of heaven by their freedom. The hallmark of a citizen of heaven is freedom. You know, it's an interesting thing. I am a, a legally a British citizen or British subject would be the correct term and also an American citizen and whenever I fly into Europe I flew into Dublin a few weeks ago you know I, I don't have to wait I get up my European passport and take the fast track there and then when I fly back out of Dublin into America I get up my American passport I am a dual citizen I function, if you will, as a citizen of both kingdoms. I have a bank account in both kingdoms. And I think at times what religion has taught us is that we, are, that we have dual citizenship. Well, our, we're citizens of heaven, amen, but we're also still really citizens of the earth. And it's like we have this dual man, the old man and the new man, trying to live in coexistence. And we're going to cover today how to walk free from sin and how to walk free from shame. Let me begin today by reading Colossians 1. Um, we're going to read from verse 12. <clears throat> Excuse me. The Apostle Paul says, Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. You've been qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has. I like the old King James. He hath. It's like past tense. Passé composé with ten Frenchy has already delivered us from the power of the dominion and the authority of darkness and has translated us, conveyed us, literally raptured us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace. 
You know, we read yesterday in Romans 8, 21, 22, that the whole creation longs. The creation, again, the King James used to say, the creation groans for the manifestations of the sons of God. And in the next two verses, it talks about the creation longs for the day when it will be released into the glorious liberty, the glorious freedom of the children of God. And I want to come on by faith, say that to you today, even if you're feeling bound, even if today you're you're not feeling like a free person. God looks at you and he says, you have an inheritance. You have the right to walk in glorious freedom. As an American citizens, I we have a bill of rights. We have certain things that I have rights as an American that a British person doesn't have, that a French person doesn't have. I have the right a freedom of speech that Brits or Americans don't have. Uh, Brits or French, excuse me, don't have in that sense. And we have rights as the citizens of heaven. Just because I have a right to something as an American doesn't mean it will arrive at my door delivered by the US mail every day. Sometimes you have to stand up for your rights. Sometimes you have to be aware of your rights. Sometimes you have to resist those who would encroach upon or take away those rights. And we have been given the right to walk in freedom in every single part of our life. So let me take you down a quick journey of how we do this practically. Yesterday, we talked about the ecclesia, the church. Really, church, you know, I might say I'm in a church building right now. This is, this is not a church. This is just a place where a local expression of the church meets. This is not a building. This is a building, but it's not a church. Yeah, I am a church, you are a church. We are the ecclesia. We are the called out ones. We've been called out of the world, but it's not enough that we self-identify as called out ones. The danger of evangelicalism is that we self-identify in terms of where we have come from. We look at the world and we go, tut, tut, tut. And so we should. We look at the world in sin and shame and say, yes, we've been called out. Come out from amongst them and be separate. God has called us out of the world, but he hasn't just called us out of the world into a holding pattern, into a waiting scenario while we wait one day for his redemption to come. The, the creation around us waits. We've been, we are a called out people, but we are a called in people. And that verse 13 we read there, Colossians 1.13 says, we've been delivered from one kingdom, but we've also been translated into another kingdom. And I, I wanna give you just a few quick keys today to walking in freedom from sin and shame. Number one, we've got to self-identify. We're no longer part of the world, amen. But we right now are citizens of heaven with the nature of God. We've been joined one with Christ Jesus. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians six seventeen, he that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. And when Jesus died, he took your old nature that Adamic nature, that satanic nature, that fallen nature, that nature with a bent for sin. You know, when outside of Christ, God isn't judging you so much on what you do and what you don't do. He's not weighing up the pros and cons of your life. You are a fallen person. You were grandfathered in. Through one man's disobedience, you were born into sin. And through one man's obedience, the man Christ Jesus, we were born again into righteousness. Before I, I was in Christ, when my identity was a sinner, okay, I was a sinner. If I did a good thing or a righteous deed, it didn't change who I was. My identity wasn't based on what I did or didn't do. Frankly, what I did or didn't do became the outworking of my identity. And when we move into a brand new kingdom, we, you see, I am a new creation. If today I do a bad thing or an unrighteous thing, now I need to repent and receive that cleansing of the blood of Jesus. I need to own that before the Lord. But my Bad deeds when I was a sinner didn't make me a righteous person. And my, excuse me, my good deeds as a sinner didn't make me a righteous person. My bad deeds as a righteous person, as a new creation, doesn't change my core identity. And we need to realize that freedom isn't so much something we do or something we try to do. It's something we've received as an inheritance I became, personally by decree, I became an American citizen. I have rights as part of this nation. Great nation, wonderful nation, glorious nation, but not a perfect nation. 
Now we have become citizens of heaven, a perfect kingdom with a perfect king. And we are citizens. We have been born free of heaven. And I want you to catch that today. And the way we live in freedom from sin isn't by trying not to sin. You see, your, your good deeds or your bad deeds are the fruit of who you believe yourself to be. And God doesn't say, come to Christ and try to be a good person. Try and live in freedom in terms of your thought life, your habits, your attitude, your desires, your anger, lust, lots of different things. What he does, what happens is we come to Christ and he gives you as a gift this identity. He gives you as a gift. You are born again. You were born a brand new person. And again, I want you to catch that today. You have been set free. The law of the spirit of life in Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Sin, sickness, poverty, disease, demons, fear, oppression, condemnation, depression, death. On and on we can go, all of the works of that. And I want to, I really want you to grasp a hold of this simple truth today. You are a free person. As you watch this video today, if there could be a hundred things I can think about. I'm a pastor. I meet with people every day that you may be bound in. And I want to challenge you. God is saying to you right now, you're free. You say, Graham, you don't know about this addiction to, you know, Coca-Cola, whatever. I heard about a guy who, could, who was addicted to brake fluid, but he said he could stop at any time. But don't. Come on. God wants you completely and utterly free in the depths of your soul. And I believe he wants you to take that freedom as an identity. It's who you are. It's what you are in Christ Jesus. Let's just talk about shame as we finish with this. It's interesting that what happens in all of our lives is we, we, all of, for all of us, we're going to sin at times. We're going to miss God's mark. We're going to get things wrong. And when we sin, we immediately usually anyway, especially in our conscience, begin to feel shame. So what happened in Adam and Eve, the very second they sinned, it wasn't like, oh, isn't this wonderful? I've become wise. They became wise, if you will. The knowledge of good and evil immediately showed them that they were naked, that they were ashamed, that the glory of God had been removed from their life, and shame came in. And immediately they began trying to cover their shame with fig leaves. And I want you to just see this progression as we finish today. What happens is we sin and shame comes into our life. And it took me a long time to realize this, but what shame will do, shame will keep you from repentance. Shame will keep you from freedom. Shame will actually keep you from pushing back into God. And it's so vital that we get this, that the biggest, one of the biggest empowering agents, one of the biggest catalysts for sin in our life is actually shame. And when we can learn to remove the stain of shame from our life, it gets very easy to repent and it gets very easy to sit in the righteousness of God. And I think so often what believers are doing is sitting in shame. It's literally like they're sitting in the guilt and wallowing in it. You know, a few weeks ago, I have a dog, wonderful dog called Aggie, a Labradoodle. And a few weeks ago, I was um, <clears throat> making some food. I was preparing a whole like batch of meals, like shepherd's pie meals, British dish that I was going to freeze. And, you know, that way I can just have them when my wife's away, pull something out and stick it in the oven. And uh, I prepared, I think, about 10 of these little dishes of shepherd's pie. And they were sitting on my kitchen counter. And I decided I'd be really generous. And I scooped a good portion and put it in my dog's bowl. And my dog, Aggie, tasted this. And I guess she really liked it. And I came back about half an hour later and I had these little 10 trays all neat that I'd set out. And my dog, there were, there were gaps in some of them. Somebody had sort of gone to the counter and scooped out of two or three of them, about a third of each. And when I saw it straight away, I noticed it and I, I immediately went, that's my dog. And I began calling my dog. I began seeking high and low. Now I have a I have a strange house. I have the original parsonage in the town of Sturbridge where I live, and it's a house that was built in the 
1800 and then somebody added another section then another section and so my house is in kind of very long and uh, in the end I went through every room in my house and ooh, from one end to the other and my my dog Aggie was hiding in the far corner of the furthest room it took me five minutes to find my dog cowering in a corner like with her eyes closed you know in that sort of attitude that says dad you know Graham if you can't see me maybe I'm not here and just shaking and ca- guilt just drenched in her face, you know? And I wasn't happy with what my dog did, <clears throat> but I forgave my dog. It probably took me about half an hour for me to convince my dog emotionally that we actually loved her, that she was forgiven. I wasn't happy with what she did, but that we actually loved her and her identity as that family pet we love wasn't actually connected with what she did or what she didn't do. And I tell you guys, it's so important we allow the freedom and the love of God to invade our life. And my encouragement to you today is allow Holy Spirit to examine your heart. Have you got shame or sin sitting in your heart? When you're in shame, shame will push you back into sin. It's amazing, again, as a pastor, how many people I've counseled and helped who were abused sexually as a child. I've seen this pattern again and again and again where somebody's abused sexually And even as a child, maybe, you know, before puberty, where they're not even sure what's going on, they intrinsically feel shame about this act that they have no guilt with, no reason to feel ashamed. It's like they feel dirty and ashamed by that. And that very shame will stop them telling, you know, others telling the parents, will stop them seeking justice about it. But the terrifying thing is so often that very shame leads them later on in life to sometimes falling into those same patterns of sin. And so often the abused can become the abuser later on in life if they don't deal with that. And sin will produce shame, which will produce sin, which will produce shame in ever widening circles. And it, what, how can we break out of that cycle? We need that cleansing of the blood of Jesus. So today, I encourage you, if you're not a Christian, call on God's name. If you are, allow that cleansing of the blood of Jesus. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us from all sin. And I encourage you to put on like a coat, put on an identity as a free person, put on an identity as a righteous person. 1 Corinthians 15 34 says, awake to righteousness and sin not. One version says, when you await your righteousness, you won't sin. When you put on righteousness, Paul says in uh, Ephesians 4, 23 and 24, put on the new man created after God in righteousness and true holiness, and then he tells you how, by being renewed in the spirit of your mind, which we'll talk about in a later lesson. Bless you guys. Thank you for watching. Again, hit that subscribe button. Check out the links below. And drop me a line if I can pray for you. It is good to have you here. We'll be back tomorrow. We're going to be talking about freedom from fear. Amen.